Welcome to Get Sleepy, the podcast where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's a pleasure to have your company. Tonight's story is one we decided to create after several of you wonderful listeners requested it. It's all about the artist Claude Monet, whose work is known for its picturesque nature scenes. But you may not have known that many of his paintings were created in his own garden. For this reason, Monet's garden may have brought more tranquility to the world than any other place on earth. Tonight, Claude will show us around his garden and we'll watch as he creates a masterpiece on canvas. We always love hearing your ideas for the podcast, so please never hesitate to get in touch if you want to send some feedback or share a story idea. You can do so via the contact page on our website. That's Get Sleepy. So now, let's get ready for our story. Begin by taking a deep breath in through the nose. And slowly release out through the mouth. Allow yourself to sink gently into the bed and feel the warmth spreading through your body. It reaches each and every part of you, soothing your muscles, softening the space around your bones and nourishing your body, mind, and soul. It feels like sunlight, like the warmth of a perfect spring morning. And it was on a perfect spring morning like this that Claude Monet, one of the great Impressionist painters, could be found in his garden, gently swirling his brush and dabbling strokes of pigment across a white canvas. So let's go and join him. The birds sing sweetly in the cherry and apple trees as a straw-hatted Claude Monet opens the door to his home. He steps outside, stroking his long grey beard and scans the Clos Normand, his grand garden the petals of newly budded flowers, pink, violet, white, and red, are glistening with dew. He smiles, satisfied with the view, and reaches down to grab a small leather satchel and a wooden easel. Down the gravel path he walks, stopping in front of an enthusiastic row of peonies. With a squint of his eye, Monet scans the pink blooms 
noting their tightly packed petals. A honeybee drones softly nearby. The air, though still cool, warms up with every moment. Yes, Monet thinks. This will be today's painting site. Monet opens his collapsible wooden easel, steadying its tripod legs atop the grey gravel path. He bends down to his satchel and opens it, uncovering short-haired paintbrushes, a wooden palette for mixing colours, and several tubes of oil paint. Even now, Forty years after its invention, Monet is still enamoured with the portability of paint tubes. The ease of use of these paints means he can work outside, quickly, squeezing ribbons of paint across his canvas or combining them upon his palette. Painting outside what artists call un plein air, was one of Monet's specialities since his early days. The young artist spent hours staring across the beaches and docks of his hometown, Le Havre, in the Normandy region of France. He noticed how the colours of the ocean morphed as the day progressed, or as the weather changed. Imagine the aquamarine or teal waves of a bright summer's day, or the gunmetal grey signalling an approaching storm. Think of the vast navy expanse of the sea at dusk, or its utter blackness at midnight. Monet studied these changes and attempted to capture these fleeting variations and transformations in his paintings, with some even painted right there on the beach. He sought to represent impressions, even titling one of his most famous canvases Impression Sunrise in 1872. When a Parisian art critic later commented that Monet and his fellow artists were impressionists, the name stuck. And though it was originally meant to be a disparaging name, Monet and his friends, like Pierre Auguste Renoir, Berta Mauriceau, and Camille Pizarro, loved it. They painted their impressions moment by moment, day by day. Today, Monet smiles, taking in a deep, calming breath. As he admires today's painting location, he recalls his first glimpses of the land that was to become his home his personal paradise. In the early 1880s, Claude Monet boarded a train that meandered slowly through the French countryside west of Paris, through golden wheat fields ploughed by horse cart, and past half-timbered houses with thatched roofs. About 50 miles west of the French capital, Monet glanced out his window and spotted the hamlet of Giverny, nestled at the confluence of the Epta and Seine rivers. Monet, in his obsession with light, watched the sun's rays shimmer across the river in small ripples, and saw it reflect upwards 
casting a delicate glow on the leaves of an apple tree nearby. And it was at that moment that he realized he was home. In 1883, Monet moved his family to Giverny and rented a cottage and a parcel of land, which he slowly transformed into a serene, botanical paradise. He expanded the small cottage into a single long building to provide more space for his family and art studio, and painted it brightly to appeal to the eye. A pastel pink for the home's exterior, and a vivid green for many of its shutters and windows. At the front of the home, Monet planted climbing roses upon a pergola that stretched the length of the façade, and Virginia creeper across the pale walls. In the summertime, the house, both then and now, blends with the landscape surrounding it. Pink and green meet the eye in every direction. Though the house was the centerpiece of Monet family life, it was its accompanying gardens that filled the artist with true joy and peace. The land surrounding the Giverny cottage was originally a farming plot, spare and unstructured. But Monet wanted flowers in a swirl of colour and texture that he could paint all year so he planted his gardens accordingly. Red poppies with their paper-like petals rustling in a springtime gust. Sunflowers arching their yellow and black faces towards the summertime sun. And black-eyed Susans vying for the last bright afternoons of autumn before the chill of winter falls upon Normandy. Monet often chose to plant his gardens based on appearance and colour, as you might expect of an artist, prioritising beauty above all. By the early 1890s, he had attained enough wealth to purchase the Giverny homestead and its surrounding lands and he set out to transform his now permanent home into the botanical paradise he imagined. In his mind's eye, Monet pictured raised beds overgrown with flowers, savouring the wildness of nature running its own course. It was a stark contrast from traditional French ornamental gardens which were established in strict lines and spacing. Monet's garden, instead, would grow freely in an abundance of contrasting tones and textures. He would plant humble flowers, like sweet white and yellow daisies, next to ornamental Japanese apricot trees green metal trellises arched across a gravel walkway, providing a climbing path for much-beloved roses. He could already smell the heady scent of those roses, freshly in bloom. His garden would become known as the Clos Normand, a potent attraction for the artist then and the tourist now. Monet would spend hours tending to his beloved plants, and when he wasn't, he was painting them. Now, today, on this crisp spring morning, Monet's plants are all happy and flourishing, having enjoyed a light evening shower the night before. 
he has no tending to do. So it's time for a painting. Before he mixes the colours on his wooden palette, Monet must prepare the canvas's ground. The ground is an even, smooth layer of light paint, usually a lead white or a very light grey, applied to the entirety of an impressionist's canvas. Oil paint by nature is mildly transparent, and when colours are applied atop this light ground, they appear brighter than on a duller, unprimed canvas. This was a hallmark of Impressionism, the brightness of paintings. They seem to glow from within. After applying the thin layer of lead white, Claude turns his attention once again to the peonies, analysing the shape of every curling leaf, the way the flower's interior is shaded or turned towards the sunlight and the woody texture of the stem. His observation is constant, and unless he pauses to clean a brush, he will look at these flowers every two or three seconds. Finally, he is ready to begin, and he dips his first paintbrush down across his palette. For an artist of such breadth and experience, you might imagine Monet's palette overflowing with a variety of paint colours, but this is not the case. With only nine proven colours at his side, Monet could mix them to produce any conceivable shade, a true sign of his mastery. It's this deep understanding of chemistry, optics, and colour theory that made his paintings indelible for viewers. This morning, he glances again at the peonies in the Clone Normand. They stand elegantly, pink, luscious, and fragrant. Monet smiles and swirls his paintbrush in madder red, his chosen crimson tone, before adding in a dollop of lead white. The colours meld into one another as Monet glances up again at the flower. He sighs. The colour is not quite right, but it's no bother. Another glance is all it takes to verify that his real-life peonies have a slight purple tinge to them. Down the palette he scans until he finds a small pool of French ultramarine, a vibrant blue. Swell, 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 until his paintbrush resembles the cacophony of blooms before him. And then, the magic begins. On the primed white canvas, Monet drags his newly pigmented paintbrush, its bristles making a pleasant scratching sound across the surface of the canvas. Every brush stroke is small, every move precise. Each repetitive dab slowly transforms into something identifiable, a single petal of an abundant bloom. The process is leisurely, mindful even, and Monet notices that his breath matches the gentle movements of his brushes. Dab, inhale. Swipe, exhale. As the moments pass, Monet changes the texture of his brush strokes, 
occasionally adding larger dollops of paint or thinning other areas out. The surface is uneven and is thus more alive, causing the eye to flutter across it. Soon there will be very little space for an optical reprieve. Every nook with shine colour, bright chrome yellow in a shower of sunlight, lush emerald green in the vines of climbing roses, a delectable concoction of vermilion, cobalt blue and lead white to approximate the large petaled clematis. Small areas of contrast scattered throughout the work make those colours pop even brighter. A hint of green next to a red rose, a purple shadow opposite a golden sunflower. The basis of this painting will be completed this morning, here in the Clos Normand. Monet might add to it in his studio this evening, or he may deem it a finished product, one of the many created hastily but confidently throughout his adult life. In all, it is believed that Claude Monet produced over 2,000 paintings, drawings and pastels though the exact number may never be known. He occasionally burned or destroyed works in which he found fault. Today's painting is deemed a successful one, however, and Monet smiles, stopping to admire his handiwork, while dabbing a cotton handkerchief on his damp forehead. He reaches down to caress the soft petals of a peony bloom before gently raising his satchel to his shoulders. Right now, it's time for a break and a relaxing stroll through his expansive gardens. His wooden easel remains here though. Monet will return to it later this afternoon to reproduce those same pink peonies in the fading light of dusk. Pulling one of those famous Normandy apples from his satchel, Monet saunters down a path that runs through the Clos Normand and perpendicular to a small road. He takes a deep breath slowing his heartbeat for a moment, before biting into the crisp red fruit. The taste fills him with joy, and he savours the sensation of tart and sweet juices, while glancing across the road to his next destination. The vision brings him back several years prior to a moment when he transformed his garden even further into something inventive, grand and inspired. The Clos Normand, with its strategic planning for year-long blooms and visual interest, originally provided Monet with years of artistic fodder. It was his great joy his personal treasure, and yet, he still wanted more. More inspiration, more flowers, maybe even another garden, perhaps. Across the road from his home, there was a marsh, a plot of land, unused except as a watering hole by roaming cattle, once again, Monet's fertile imagination sprang to life. On the swampland, 
he envisioned a floating garden, a pond filled with aquatic plants. The inspiration for such a garden most likely came from Monet's love of Japanese culture, a genuine fascination that was shared by many in Western Europe during the last decades of the 19th century. He had discovered Asian water gardens in Japanese prints, which he collected with nearly as much fervour as he did plants for the Clos Normand. Within a few years, Monet had amassed over 200 Japanese woodblock prints. A floating garden would be the perfect combination of all that he loved most. Botany, culture, and of course, art. By 1893, Monet had purchased the much coveted parcel of land and began the arduous process of transforming it into a water garden. By 1895, it already resembled the famous locale that he is venturing to today, crossing the road and clambering down to his Japanese water garden. Lush weeping willows cascade downward over a serene pond. Woody, green bamboo lines the water. Japanese maples and Asian varieties of peonies and wisteria provide pops of colour. Here, Monet elegantly connected Asian culture and design with that of Normandy. Most notable was Monet's commissioning of two curved Japanese bridges, which gracefully crest above the water in delicate arches. Unlike their traditional counterparts, which are typically painted red, Monet painted his bridges a bright blue-green. The Japanese bridge itself would later become a focal point for a series of paintings representing its curves in all seasons and atmospheric conditions. The fiery foliage of fall and the mists of a cool winter morning. Though the bridge was truly a delight, a final element of the water garden soon took precedence not only in Monet's mind, but in his art legacy, the water lilies. Standing at the water's edge, Monet glances down to the surface of the pond, counting the endless green lily pads that have made their home here. 10, 20, 30, there's no way to count them all. Some showcase delicate purple lilies and, occasionally, a small green frog. These water lilies have become Monet's singular focus. He tends to them with the help of a full-time gardener. To friends, he frequently proclaims that his water garden and those water lilies could send him into pure rapture. It is one of the primary reasons that now, and for the last 30 years of his life, Monet rarely leaves Giverny. He much prefers contemplating the water garden's changing colours on a spring day, or analysing the surface of the pond after a dusting from a winter snowstorm. He became fascinated not only with the change of light, but how the slightest motion 
sent ripples along the surface of the pond, transforming the reflections of the water lilies into blurs of colour and indistinct form. Monet, with his ever-open eyes, now watches as a stiff breeze remakes the blue depths of the pond into a light grey pool. He notes that a fallen leaf briefly obstructs a view of the pond floor and sends black shadows beneath it. Every season, every day, every moment could bring a new artistic revelation. A new impression to spontaneously capture. It's no surprise then that he would eventually paint over 250 images alone of these water lilies from his water garden. These canvases, collectively known as the Nymphias, are among the most prized of all of Monet's works. When we view his paintings today, it is sometimes easy to forget their grandeur, their power, and their meaning. But they left a significant legacy in an unsuspecting art world. Impressionism inched art closer to abstraction than ever before. It transformed notions of how light, colour, tone and texture could be displayed and provided new ways to express emotions or sensations within the physical confines of paint. In this way, Monet's paintings can certainly be viewed as masterpieces, but we can consider his garden as a great masterpiece too. These gardens were, and are, works of art that inspired creations of their own. And they continue to inspire artists in the present day. Today, though, Monet's thoughts are far from his artistic legacy. He's immersed in the moment in the gardens he has lovingly planted and will continue to lovingly paint. Even now, the beauty of his surroundings still takes his breath away. After a day of painting and admiring his home, the sun sets behind the willows over the water garden. Monet rests against the sturdy trunk of a tree he grew from infancy. He listens to the crickets chirp and the frogs croak. The moon, looming lightly, will quiet the garden's usual riot of colour into permutations of blues, purples and greys. Soon it will be dark, so he stands and makes his way back across the Japanese bridge, up the road to the Clos Norman in search of rest. Monet takes a breath one more time so that he can enjoy a final whiff of the flowers that surround him. An owl hoots nearby as Monet pads up the gravel path once more, heading into his house and closing the green door behind him. He says good night to his beloved garden, his deepest inspiration, knowing He'll return to it 
when morning comes.